Good morning, church family. Isn't it sweet to hear about the Lord working through uh, young folks from our congregation? Well, that was not very encouraging. Uh, was it sweet to hear about God working through young folks in our congregation? Amen, right? Yeah, and I think I'm qualified at this point in my life to call Sam and Tara and Lizzie Young. So there you go. I hope that, that their testimony, their example would be a challenge for us to be on mission, to be taking the gospel, the hope of Jesus Christ, to the nations, those who are near, those who are far. Right? Jesus said that the mission and the fields are ripe for the harvest. Well, if you're new here this morning, I want to welcome you, and uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Nick Lees. I have the privilege of studying God's Word with you this morning, and we're jumping right back into our study of the Song of Solomon. Now, this is week two of this series. We kicked it off last week by taking an overview of the entire book, and so if you weren't able to be here or listen to it during the week, would really encourage you to go back and listen to that sermon because it will help you understand and connect the dots in the rest of this series. But as we discussed last week, the Song of Solomon has a lot to say about biblical sexuality. And we define sexuality this way. It's our capacity and even design for sexual feelings. And when it comes to sexuality, we heard that there are two options or two ways that you can go on this issue. You can either live according to God's word and, and his ways, or you can live according to the world's views of this and their ways. And God's ways lead to life, but the world's ways lead to death. And we actually took some time last week, just briefly, to kind of survey the wreckage that we've seen both inside and outside of the church as people pursue alternatives to God's design for sexuality. In fact, we, we heard that there's eternal consequences in some cases of getting this wrong. And so uh, these are serious matters, and there's a lot that's at stake here. So without shame, over the next four weeks, we're going to spend uh, that time studying God's ways and his design for sexuality. Because we want life, right? We don't want death. We want healthy, enjoyable relationships, especially in marriage. And the Song of Solomon is going to show us the ideal of marriage that is beautiful and attainable, even in our broken and sin-cursed world. So as we uh, jump back in today, I just want to remind you that the Song of Solomon is poetry, which means that it's full of evocative imagery. Uh, it's not always to be taken literally. So we're going to need wisdom as we study it together and as we seek to interpret it correctly. So I wanted to start our sermon uh, by praying for wisdom. Would you bow your heads with me as I ask the Lord for wisdom? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thankful that you've protected it and preserved it through the, through the years and that we can study it here today together. And uh, Lord, we're thankful for Song of Solomon specifically. And understand, Lord, that um, we need to do diligent work in order to understand it and apply it well to our lives. And so we ask right now for your help in doing that. We ask for wisdom and understanding it correctly. And then we ask for the boldness and courage to apply it to our lives. That we wouldn't walk out of here the same as when we came in but we'd be challenged and encouraged and equipped to better honor you in this particular area of our lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, go ahead and uh, get your Bibles and turn to the Song of Solomon, and I'll invite our ushers forward. If you need a Bible, you can throw your hand in the air, and they'll give you a blue Bible to use this morning. And if you have one of those Bibles, you'll want to turn to page 323. That'll get you to the Song of Solomon, chapter 1. And today, as we study, we're going to cover the first two chapters of the song. And how we're going to approach it is, I'm going to read it aloud for us, all of chapter 1 and 2, and I'll take some time to pause at different points and, and give a little bit of commentary on what we're reading. And then we'll get into some specific lessons that we can then take away from the text. So with that in mind, let's, let's pick up here in chapter 1, verse 1. Here's what it says. The Song of Songs which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. Therefore, virgins love you. Draw me after you. Let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will exult and rejoice in you. We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. I am very dark, but lovely. 
O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Tell me, you whom my soul loves, where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon. For why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companions? Let's just pause there for a moment. Uh, What you're hearing already in the first half of chapter 1 is the woman expressing her intense desire for her man. Right? She desires his affection. She desires to be with him. Um, She is also explain a little bit about herself and her appearance from being a worker out in the sun. But then she calls out to him and she says, tell me how to find you. I desire to be with you. So let's keep reading in verse 8. He responds, he says, if you do not know, O most beautiful among women, follow in the tracks of the flock and pasture your young goats beside the shepherd's tents. I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. We will make for you ornaments of gold studded with silver. While the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of Engedi. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. Behold, you are beautiful, my beloved, truly delightful. Our couch is green, the beams of our house are cedar, our rafters are pine. So in the second half of the chapter, we hear the man responding to her. She desires him, she wants to be in his presence, and he says, here's how you can find me. Follow the tracks and you'll end up where I am. And then he also has words to express about her and his desire for her, and uh, the things he appreciates about her. Both of them going back and forth, using, again, very evocative imagery. Uh, these you know, poems meant to kind of draw all of your senses in, sight, smell, sound, uh, all of it. It's, it's meant to just be a beautiful picture of, of their love for one another. And then they get to this point where they have these terms of endearment. She is his beloved, or that's what she calls him, rather, and he calls her my love. Right, so that's, that's what we're hearing, powerful terms of endearment to one another. Let's pick back up in chapter 2, verse 1. She says, I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. As a lily among brambles, so is my love among the young women. As an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. With great delight, I sat in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am sick with love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. So again, there's this back and forth, the man and the woman expressing just how much uh, they value their loved one over everyone else. Right? She's the lily among all the other women who are the brambles. And to her, he's the apple tree, where all the other men are just plain old trees of the forest. And she delights to be in his presence. She delights to have his protection. She's intoxicated with his love. But then in verse 7, we hear this. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. So there's a word of, of warning given. She continues, the voice of my beloved Behold, he comes, leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me. Do you begin to feel some of the anticipation, like some of the desire? She's so excited that, that she spotted her loved one and he's coming to her. And she's excited to hear his voice. And here's what he says. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree ripens its figs, and the vines are in blossom, they give forth fragrance. 
arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. So he's inviting her, saying, look, spring has sprung. New life is everywhere we have to look. You know, again, I meant, meant to give you these, these beautiful visuals, the flowers blooming, the fig trees blossoming, right? The fragrances coming to your, your nose, like powerful imagery of he is wanting to be with his loved one and enjoy God's creation. He continues, oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the crannies of the cliff, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Right, he appreciates her presence. He wants to hear her and see her. But then there's this second warning, call to action even. Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. And it closes with these two verses. My beloved is mine and I am his. He grazes among the lilies until the day breeze and the shadows flee. Turn, my beloved, be like a gazelle or a young stag on cleft mountains. So there's this dedication of one to the other. They are for each other and no one else. So there's a lot there, right? A lot of poetic imagery, a lot of things that are meant to draw all of your senses in, um, a lot of just sweetness between these two lovers. But what do we do with that? What do we learn from this dialogue? How does a modern-day audience like us approach this and, and take something away from it? Well, that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time discussing as we're learning to handle sexuality biblically. And here's our first lesson. It is good for spouses to express intense desire for one another. It is good for spouses to express intense desire for one another. That's really what we've been witnessing over the first two chapters of Song of Solomon. Right? There's mutual pursuit, and it's biblical and it's good. Right? Both are coming after each other. It's not just the husband pursuing the wife or only the wife pursuing the husband. They are, they're seeking after each other. They're moving towards one another. It's good for sexual desire to be expressed by both. And we heard this last week that biblical love is powerful and intoxicating. And it's a love that's both physical and yet also relational. And so what we observe here is they kiss, they embrace, or they speak words of life to one another, and they just want to spend time together. They delight to spend time together. And this is a love that, that draws them together. It unites them. Now, we know that this is a far cry from the reality of many marriages in our sin-cursed world today. And perhaps you're here, and this is a far cry from your marriage reality. And if that's the case for you this morning, first, I'm saddened to hear that, but also I hope to give you hope through this series that there is a better way that both you and your spouse might take steps of growth and repentance wherever it's needed. You see, in, in our day and age and in our reality, many have let their pursuit and desire for one another dwindle. The idea of expressing intense desire for your spouse may seem a bit absurd to you this morning. Perhaps those kind of desires flamed out long ago. Perhaps your spouse fails to invite you to pursue them. Those are not reasons to give up. I want to encourage you that those are hurdles that you will have to overcome in the race to please the Lord in this area of your life and marriage. We live in a day and age where it's all about selfish sex. It's all about me, right? What I want, how I want, when I want. It's all dependent on my desires. That is an anti-biblical approach to sexuality. And yet it's the approach that's lauded by our pornography industry, and ultimately by our own selfish hearts. Both men and women who are here this morning need to be aware of the danger of approaching intimacy in this kind of way. Right? If we're left to ourselves, we will be prone to selfishness in this area, just like any other area of our lives. So you must be on guard against both selfish aggressiveness and selfish passivity in this area. Let's take a moment to just kind of describe those and see what they might look like. So selfish aggressiveness. 
looks like this. You only pursue when it suits you. And in a way that's seeking to satisfy your desires. That's selfish aggressiveness. What about selfish passivity or selfish passiveness? Well, that looks like failing to pursue your spouse and only responding to pursuit from your spouse when it suits you. Both of them are oriented around self and what you want rather than serving the other. And both go against the uh, ideal of Scripture that we see here in Song of Solomon and also in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 7. So let me take you into the New Testament for a moment. Paul's writing in chapter 7, verses 2 through 5, he writes this, But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So what we're hearing from God's word in this chapter is that it's good for a husband and wife to pursue one another and to seek to serve one another in this area. The language of 1 Corinthians 7 is do not deprive one another. That the time that you abstain is only by mutual agreement so that you can pray and then you come back together again. Now why do you think that God would put such a priority in his word on regular ongoing marital intimacy? Why would he emphasize that in some part of his word? Well, he tells us right here in that passage, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. This is a protection against the wiles of our enemy. Regular selfless pursuit of your spouse protects them from temptation to sin. And sexuality is a part of our design, and it is a powerful part of our design. When used appropriately as God has designed it, it brings a couple together. It unites them and it continues to protect their marriage for a lifetime. When used poorly, that power becomes misguided and misdirected and it leads to sin and division, disunity. Now notice how the couple in Song of Solomon, they express their intense desire for one another. We see it throughout these chapters. And you might be surprised to realize that the wife goes first. Look at chapter 1 again, verses 1 through 4. She starts this song by expressing her desire for her man to kiss her. Then she begins to talk about how desirable he is. And she gives specific reasons. Right? She praises his love, or that could be translated his love making. She appreciates and praises his scent, right? his odor. Uh, his name even, his reputation perhaps, these things make him desirable to many, but he has chosen her, and she delights in it. And so she invites him to bring her in, into his chambers. The word king here is a metaphor for her lover, the bridegroom, the one who in her eyes has the significance, beauty, and charm worthy of a king. Now, we may not realize this yet. I don't know if you've read the whole song at any point in the last few weeks, but over the course of the eight chapters, the woman does more of the speaking than the man. We observe a wife who's not afraid to verbally express how much she loves and desires her husband. Look, for instance, at chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. In chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, she's expressing her anticipation of his nearness, his presence, and of hearing his voice, right? That gets her excited. She's ready to be with him. Or in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 2, uh, again, she's expressing her devotion to him alone, right? They are for one another exclusively, and they're excited about that. But the woman is not alone in her desires, Oh, no. He, he responds too, doesn't he? And he invites her to find him. If you go back now to chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, 
right? He responds and says, here's how you find me. Here's how we can be together. And then he begins to express specific ways that she is desirable. She's so beautiful. She's like a mare placed among Pharaoh's chariots. And if you know anything about horses, which I don't until I had to start studying this, uh, when you take a mare, which is a female horse, and you put it in front of a bunch of stallions, which would have been what pulling Pharaoh's chariots, it's going to be chaos, right? All those male horses, are they got their focus on that female horse. And the man here is expressing that she has his attention. And likely she has the attention of many men because she's so beautiful. But he goes on to say, here's what I appreciate about you. And then he gives specifics. I want to also draw your attention to the terms of endearment, right, that they have for one another. So starting in verse 9 of chapter 1, he calls her my love. And he will repeat that term five times over the course of these two chapters. And he'll keep using it throughout the book. And her term for him is my beloved. That first shows up in chapter 1, verse 13. And she repeats it nine times in these two chapters. So what you're seeing and hearing is they're very comfortable expressing their love and their desire for one another. There's no, no shame here. And it really culminates in chapter 2, verses 10 through 14, as he invites her to come away with him. Right? His desire is to spend time with her and to enjoy the beauty of God's creation. And he delights to see her face and hear her voice. So it's good for spouses to express intense desire for one another. But what if you're not in the habit of doing this? Or what if you've let your love grow cold? If that's where you're at today, first, I'm thankful that you're here. But I hope the very next question out of your mouth is, how can I cultivate this type of love? How can I get to where they're at? What do I do to get to where they are? And the answer to that question is going to bring us to our next lesson, which is about how we ought to use our words. Words ought to be used to bless one another. Words ought to be used to bless one another. And that's really what we observe throughout these two chapters, is these two are very creative in how they express their love for one another. They intentionally move between uh, these powerful and even fragrant imageries to help convey what they're trying to say. And both of them are doing it very specifically and very intentionally in order to positively praise their lover. So, to him, she is like the lily among the brambles. And to her, he is the apple tree in comparison to all those other old plain boring trees that are in the forest. Her eyes are like beautiful doves. And he is like a strong and nimble gazelle or young stag. Well, what do we learn from that? Do we need to start going to the botanical gardens and the zoos in order to figure out how to get some words to use with our honey? Is that what we take from this? Well, maybe not that. Maybe that's not the takeaway. But it would be good for us, for you, for me to learn how to use our words to serve our spouse, bless our spouse, to express the, the delight that we have in our spouse. Do you appreciate your spouse? And do you regularly express delight and appreciation for them? For many of us, if we're being honest, this is an area of weakness in our relationships. It's far too easy to see the things that irritate us, the things that we don't like, rather than the things that we're thankful for. Right? We, we miss the blessings of their character and their conduct and even appreciating their presence or their appearance. And when we start to take our spouse for granted, that then puts us on a dangerous path. It's all too easy for our words to become more and more critical and ungrateful. Wait, we begin to point out their flaws and their failures rather than the things that they're good at and the blessing that they are to us. But the couple in Song of Solomon show us a better way. The way of building each other up with our words. Of delighting in our spouse of cultivating thankfulness for them. So again, I'll draw your attention to chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. In this section, the woman is expressing the safety and the nourishment that she finds in her husband's presence. 
right? She doesn't only say, you're above the rest. She also says, I delight to spend time with you. I enjoy your fruit, which would be his kisses or perhaps intimacy. She's thankful for his protection. And she continues to invite him to pursue her. For she's intoxicated with his love. You see, the start to intimacy, it begins in your own thinking and and in your own desires. Are you cultivating a right view of your spouse? Are you stoking the flames of desire for them? And then are you giving expression to those right views and desires so that they know that you love them and that you desire them? I love how this couple is just repeatedly going back and forth, right? They're expressing, you're better, right? The, the lover is better than anyone else. So we see it here. She's the lily among the brambles. He's the apple tree among, again, all those other old boring trees. They're saying, my husband, my wife, is uniquely my standard of beauty. She is the standard of beauty to me. He's the standard of handsomeness to me. So in my life, Michaela Lees is the standard of beauty. In your life, that's your spouse. And no one else compares. We'll continue to see ways that these lovers express that concept in the chapters ahead. So again, it's good for spouses to express intense desire for one another. And words ought to be used to bless one another. Those are the two positive lessons that we're going to take from the chapters today. But now we've got to turn our attention to two negative lessons. And when we say negative, I'm not talking about like bad lessons, but rather lessons that are meant to warn us, to protect us from dangers that we we need to avoid. And so the first one of these is found in chapter 2, verse 7. Turn your attention there. We'll read it again. It says this, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love. Until it pleases. Here's the lesson. Heed the warning about rightly aroused passions. Heed the warning about rightly aroused passions. We know this, that as humans, it is easy to misuse sexuality. It's hard at times to handle it rightly. Because these desires are so powerful, it's tempting to use them inappropriately both inside and outside of marriage. So, for example, it is inappropriate and ungodly to tempt others. We see in the book of Proverbs the father warning his son against the temptations of the adulterous woman. Proverbs 7, verses 21 through 23, he says this, With much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver. As a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. Or if we were to go back to the New Testament again to the book of Corinthians, Paul warns them in chapter 6 verse 15, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. And those are just two of many different scenarios that we could pick of ways that we might misuse sexuality inside and outside of marriage. But the overarching teaching of the Bible is that biblical sexuality is only appropriately expressed within the confines of monogamous marriage between one man and one woman. So what that means for us this morning whether you're young or you're old, everyone needs to listen to this. You need to beware the way that you interact with others. You need to beware the ways that you interact with others. Flirting is a dangerous game to play. It doesn't matter whether you're a teenager or an adult here this morning. It's a dangerous game to play. What is the aim of flirtation? You want the attention of the other person, and perhaps you want them to desire you. You're arousing passions that cannot be righteously fulfilled, which is unwise, and it very quickly turns to sin. As Christian men and women, we must protect one another. This is an area where so many relationships go astray. We begin to play the game of how close to the line can I get before it's sin, rather than 
how far away from the line of sin can I stay? In our world's philosophy on sex, that's what you should try before you buy. Right? You've got to figure out, are we compatible in this area? Maybe you've heard that in the church, too. I hope not. But sadly, some churches probably push that reality. But it's patently unbiblical. The only right place to awaken these desires is within marriage. And it won't provide the compatibility or the joy that it promises. In actuality, what it will do is rob you of joy and it will leave you and your partners feeling broken. So we must be careful to heed the warnings of Scripture. God is our creator and he knows what is best for us. He knows what will lead to a fruitful, joy-filled marriage. So I want to exhort you to trust God's wisdom and his ways over the world's wisdom and their ways. Now, there's a, a difficult reality that we need to address. It's one we've already kind of touched earlier, but we need to go back to it. Right, there are many marriages that are not the garden paradise of Genesis 2 or of Song of Solomon. Conflict and divorce are at high rates, and frankly, the odds are that there are many marriages, even here in the room today, that are struggling in some form or fashion. It's just the difficult reality of our sin-cursed, broken world. And perhaps you're here and you, you started strong, right? You handled dating and engagement well. You went to premarital counseling. And you, you sought to start your marriage off on the right foot with trusting the Lord. But somewhere along the way, compromises began to occur. Communication began to fall apart. Conflicts were not being resolved quickly or even at all. Silence began to replace the conversation around the dinner table. And intimacy became a thing of the distant past. For others, maybe your marriage began without Christian influence or guidance. Perhaps you began your physical relationship long before the wedding day. And the luster's worn off over the years. Maybe you've never had someone who's able to pour into your life and to help you break patterns of behavior and sin that have been present in your life for years. Or perhaps you're single. Single with a history of bad relationships or single with a history of no relationships. Perhaps you desire one. I mean, singles have to be on guard as well. It's tempting to take these matters into your own hands. I'm going to be the one who determines my relationship status. I'll find the one. And we fail to trust God in the journey. That becomes a dangerous pursuit as well. Now the hope for each one of these scenarios is Jesus. Jesus, no matter what your circumstances may be, no matter how broken and beyond repair or hope they may seem to you, no matter what kind of baggage that you have from your past or even in your present, Jesus is your hope. He is the Redeemer. He's the one who takes our sin and our brokenness and by faith makes us new forgives us of our sin and by the power of his redeeming love he can change you he can change your spouse he can lead you back to a place of unity again and even if your spouse doesn't want to come along for that journey jesus can bear the burden and he can provide you with satisfaction that endures even in the face of great trial and that's true whether you're married or single he can satisfy you, no matter what your situation is, no matter what you're wrestling with. Your hope cannot be in your marriage being restored, or your spouse changing, or your relationship status moving from single to married. Those things are not meant to bear the weight of your hopes. As one author puts it, those are stairs of sand. They will collapse beneath the weight of your hopes and expectations. They were never meant to bear them in the first place. Only the one true God can bear the weight of your hopes and expectations. And only he can sustain you when life feels like it's falling apart all around you. So Jesus must be your hope. Not only when things are going your way, but especially when they're not going your way. So, if your spouse never changes, 
Will you trust and hope in Christ? Will you believe that he is doing a good work in your life through that trial? Will you continue to obey his call for you to be a godly, loving spouse? Or if your situation is that you're single, will you trust him to be a godly, loving, single person? Do not make your faith and your obedience to the Lord conditional on him doing what you want him to do. That's not Christianity. That's idolatry. That's us making God into our own image of what we think he ought to be like. And God addresses the possibility of sin in marriage here in the Song of Solomon. We actually see hints of it in verse 15 of chapter 2. So let's go back and look at verse 15 here. I'll read it again. It says this. Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. We brought this passage up last week briefly just to point out that foxes are very destructive. When when they're chasing after their prey, they don't care what's around them. They don't appreciate the beauty of a vineyard. They'll dig and they'll uh, go all over the place to scavenge for what they're wanting. And the point here is that there are a lot of threats to marriage that need to be caught and rooted out before they destroy the beauty of it. So let's learn the final lesson that we have for today, and it's this. Beware the little foxes that will wreck your marriage. Beware the little foxes that will wreck your marriage. Now, what are, what are some examples of these little foxes? We could probably spend the rest of the day and well into the week talking about all the different answers to that question, right? There are a lot of them. As I was thinking about this and, and weighing this, there are a few that I wanted to draw our attention to today, and certainly we can get into others in future weeks. But how about this? The little fox called lust. We hear, do not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not commit adultery in the Big Ten, right? The Ten Commandments for a reason. Unchecked desire for someone other than your spouse will wreck your marriage. So you need to flee from this and cultivate an intense desire for your spouse. How about the little fox of greed? Ephesians 5.3 has always been a, a favorite verse of mine about just purity and holiness. But often I found it's easy to overlook that last word, covetousness, or other translations would say greediness. So let's look at Ephesians 5, 3 together. It says this, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not be even named among you as is proper among saints. A constant desire for more, of wanting uh, more in your life or a discontentment with what you have will wreck your marriage. It could be a desire for more money or more possessions or a certain standard of living that leads you to be married to your job rather than your spouse. It could be that you want more me time. And so I need my hobbies. I need to have time to do what I want. And that leads to distance from my family and from my spouse. And there's just a number of ways that greed can get in the way of a healthy marriage. Well, what about the little fox of selfishness? Typically, marriage is the great revealer of selfishness. When I was a college student engaged to Michaela, getting ready for our wedding day, uh, I had a, a number of friends that got married a year or two ahead of me. And so I asked them, without them knowing, I asked each of them separately to the men, hey, what have you learned in your first year of marriage? And it was amazing how consistent the response was without them knowing it. But all of them, without fail, said, how selfish I am. Right, because the reality is, is that when we're living by ourselves, uh, we kind of do things how we want, when we want. But then when you get married and you, you suddenly share everything and are under the same roof together all day long, every day, you begin to see how selfish you are. And it reveals that about us. And it's a stretch. It's a challenge to die to self in order to serve our spouse. And if we're not intentional to start dying to self on day one, Guess what? It's a whole lot harder on day 10 or day 100 or day 365. We, we establish patterns that are not, not good, not helpful. And, and selfishness is really the bent of our sinful heart. We need the Lord to help us in, in order to, to fight against it. It comes far too easily to think about 
me and what do I want rather than about you and what would serve and bless you. But thankfully, Christ's example for us is of laying down his life for the good of his bride. That he models selfless sacrifice for us. And that's our calling, to selflessness, not selfishness. How about the little fox of pride? And pride is certainly closely related to everything that came before it. It's often called the root of all sin. It's the exaltation of self. It's, it's putting ourselves in God's position, essentially, and acting like everyone else and everything else needs to cater to us. So in a marriage, pride looks like never being willing to admit your fault in a problem. It sounds like constantly blaming your spouse for whatever's going on. It leads you to put your own priorities first as if they're the most important. And it's unwilling often to be corrected or shown a better way. The last little fox we'll look at this morning is sinfully used emotions. Sinfully used emotions. Now, emotions are a good thing. They're God-given. They're not inherently bad. However, it's very easy for us to twist them for sinful purposes, to try to use them to control or to manipulate situations to go the way that we want. So, for example, with anger, instead of it being a strong rush of energy to help us solve a problem that's in front of us, we take it and we twist it and we use it to batter down all of the opposition and to get our way and to make them shut up and do what we want. And sadness, instead of being an appropriate response to sin and suffering, then gets twisted and manipulated to be this technique to get you to feel bad about me and, and to get you to forget about whatever it was that originally started this whole problem in the first place. These are ways that emotions can be twisted and used sinfully and done that way they will wreck a marriage so that's a quick survey right that's not all of them but that's some of them we'll talk about future breeds of foxes in future sermons but here's what i want you to take away as we as we kind of land the plane today when you see these types of little foxes in your relationships ask others for help in catching them you may not notice this from our english translations here but verse 15 the verb catch is plural So the man or the woman or both are asking others around them to help us catch these foxes, right? They recognize they can't do it on their own. They need help. And it would be wise for us to learn from their example. So are you vulnerable to the point where others would even know that you need help in your relationships? Do you let others in? Do you share the things you're struggling with? And I would advocate that small groups is a great place to begin to do that, to practice this kind of one another community. But you have to choose to let others in. You have to invite them to catch those little foxes with you. They won't know if you don't let them know. But this is so helpful in creating a healthy marriage. So I want to commend it to you this morning. Now, I told you last week that during this sermon series, I was going to try to give you practical takeaways and growth work. And and I want to be a man of my word. And you guys, I'm sure, want me to be a man of my word, right? So here we go. Let's talk about just a couple of things. What are we going to do this week as a result of what we're learning today? Get your pens out. Get your papers ready. Whatever you're taking notes on. Here are a few ways we're going to be applying what we're learning. First one is this. Evaluate your part of any marital problems. Evaluate your part of any marital problems. Jesus says in Matthew 7 that take the log out of your own eye first. Let's get about that business. And as there there are things that you see that, that you need to address, then do that. Confess the sin and ask forgiveness. And if you would say, I have no idea how to do that. We've never done that in our relationship. Then that's okay. Like, ask your small group leader for help, or uh, reach out to me or one of the pastors. We'd love to come alongside you and help you. And I want to point out, there's three of these that we're going to walk through. These can still be applied for a single person. You may not be married, but you have relationships. So consider how this can apply in your circumstance. The second one is this. Keep a daily journal of how you used your words. All right, so just simply at the end of the day, taking a time to just reflect and consider, were my words today 
building others up or tearing others down. A, a verse that I found very helpful as a framework for evaluating this is Ephesians 4.29. It gives a very straightforward guideline for godly speech. Take some time to do that and reflect. And then if the answer is, I've used my words for, ter- for tearing down, right? Well, you know what to do next. You confess and ask forgiveness. Change. The last thing here, the last big one, make a list of 20 things you're thankful for about your spouse. Make a list of 20 things you're thankful for about your spouse. Right, so being intentional to cultivate that, that desire for them, uh, that appreciation for them. And then I would encourage you to begin to share it with them throughout the week. Look for appropriate opportunities to let them know that you care and that you appreciate them. And I hope that we'll take these things seriously and that God will begin to do a great work of of growth and um, just sanctification in our lives and in our relationships, whether you're single or married, that we would grow together. Let's end in a word of prayer.